Historians have written about the events and people of the end of the 18th century that the American and French revolutions opened up an era of glory seekers. But among the dozens of famous princes and statesmen, generals and reformers of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, none could match the two rulers of human destinies, Emperor Alexander I of Russia and Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte of France. The gripping dramatic contest between the two giants determined the history of the 19th century. The great powers began a new round of struggle for world domination. The peace treaty of Amiens, concluded by Britain and France on the 27th of March 1802, did not last long. The British carried on with the expansion of their colonial empire. They succeeded in ousting the French army from Egypt and in the almost complete conquest of India. Their navy, headed by a cluster of talented admirals such as the famous Lord Nelson, assumed control of the seas worldwide. The naval tyranny of London was not just contemporary rhetoric. When Denmark did not wish to follow in the mainstream of British politics and the heir to her crown, Prince Frederick, made friends with Emperor Paul of Russia and closed Danish ports for British vessels, Nelson's fleet immediately set out to bombard Copenhagen on the 2nd of April, 1801. The First Consul of France effectively recarved the political map of old Europe in every direction and augmented French influence in Germany, Holland, Switzerland and Italy. One day in May 1803, during an official reception, the First Consul approached Sir Charles Whitworth, British ambassador to France. So you have evidently decided to declare war on us, Napoleon asked him with sharp coldness. The courtiers stood still, not daring to move. No, we highly appreciate the benefits of peace, answered the diplomat. His restraint, however, could not prevent the First Consul from taking one of the most fateful decisions of his life. Addressing his words not so much to Whitworth as to other ministers and his own attendants, Napoleon went on. You have already forced us to wage war for ten years. Now you would like to fight for fifteen years more. You compel me to do it. The English want war, but if they unsheath their sword first, I will be the last one to put it back. England does not respect treaties. Well, then let them be hung with a black veil. Now it mattered which side would gain support from the young Tsar of Russia. Alexander took care to surround his throne with loyal people whom he regarded as personal friends. There were four of them, Count Pavel Stroganov, the Polish Prince Adam Tsartoryski, Nikolai Novosiltsev, and Count Viktor Kochubé. To experienced dignitaries and administrators of Catherine's days, 
they were known as the Young Friends. Alexander and his young friends shared many of their political sympathies and aversions. They were attracted by two forms of government, the French Republic and the British Constitutional Monarchy. Pavel Stroganov had first-hand knowledge of the Revolution of 1789. He spent several years in France and appeared in the streets of Paris in a red Frisian cap accompanied by Terroine de Méricourt, the notorious courtesan and revolutionary heroine. Prince Adam Tsartariski was a more complicated figure. His service to the Russian Emperor was intended to achieve his principal purpose, to restore Polish statehood under the Tsar's protection if necessary. Nikolai Novotsiltsev an admirer of British constitutional monarchy, was the eldest of the young friends. A gifted statesman, he had equal success as president of the Academy of Sciences and chairman of the Council of State and the Committee of Ministers. Count Victor Kochube was noted for his ability to select skillful officials. It was through his patronage that the star of Mikhail Speransky rapidly rose in the sphere of Russian politics. In May 1801, Alexander created the so-called Privy Committee, comprising the Tsar himself and his four young friends. Its members hoped that this organ would devise measures for radical reform in the internal policy of the Empire. Heeding of the reforming inclinations of the Tsar's advisers, Gavril Derjavin called the committee a Jacobin gang. But this time, the famous poet and keen statesman was too rash in his judgment. Committee sessions never smacked of any Jacobin spirit. The Privy Committee turned to Frédéric César de la Halle for consultation. Alexander invited him to Russia again in August 1801. La Halle advised his regal ward not to hurry especially with constitutional projects and abolition of serfdom. He recommended Alexander not to renounce autocracy, whose unlimited powers, he believed, could be used to promote reforms in the future. Emperor Alexander himself had grave doubts about his domestic policy. Most of all, he was afraid to share the tragic fate of his father, Accordingly, he took good heed of La Harpe's suggestions and did not precipitate constitutional reform in the belief that unrestricted authority of the Tsar was more important for the traditions of the empire and the psychology of his people. Tacking between the liberal and the conservative parties of his court became the essence of Alexander's political strategy. The less certain internal reforms became, the more tempting it was for the Tsar and his young friends to demonstrate their liberal principles in the sphere of international politics. Napoleon's intention to encircle France with a cordon of satellite states ruled by favorable or subordinate governments seemed tyrannical to Alexander and his ministers while the anti-French policy of London was considered an example of justice. This attitude of the Russian Tsar could not remain a secret for British diplomacy. Britain's political leader, William Pitt the Younger, began to forge the third anti-French coalition, making full use of gold and promises. 
On the 6th of November, 1804, Russia concluded a military alliance with Austria, and on the 11th of April, 1805, another one with Britain. The Allies hoped that their propaganda would compel most Frenchmen to refuse to support Napoleon's regime. The Third Coalition could count on about half a million men. The British Navy had to blockade the coast of France. Two Austrian armies served as the first echelon of the invading forces. Archduke Ferdinand's army was expected to occupy Bavaria and to persuade the Bavarian elector, Maximilian Ludwig, to join the Allies. The Russian army, under General Mikhail Kutuzov, was sent to reinforce Archduke John. Russian descents on Pomerania and Italy were planned. In addition, the Russians were to be supported in Pomerania by the Swedes, and in Italy by the Austrians under Archduke Charles and the core of the Kingdom of Naples. The Allies also believed they could win Prussia over to their side. On the 9th of September, 1805, the Austrian army of 80,000 men, formerly headed by Archduke Ferdinand, but actually commanded by his Chief of Staff, General Mack, who had ample powers from Emperor Franz II, invaded Bavaria. This war was to last until 1815. The French expected Consul Bonaparte to rid them of four afflictions, poverty, war, crime, and the restoration of the House of Bourbon. The Consul did his best to justify the nation's confidence. First of all, Napoleon hastened to rid himself of Sillet, who dreamed of playing his own political game. On the 13th of December, 1799, Bonaparte and his adherents insisted on adopting a new constitution, whereby three consuls were appointed, Napoleon, Cambaceres, and Lebrun, with Napoleon acting as first consul. On the 2nd of May, 1803, the British ambassador, Charles Whitworth, departed from Paris. War broke out between Britain and France. Napoleon avidly prepared to launch a massive descent on the British Isles. 120,000 crack troops, forming the so-called Army of Ocean Shores, were mustered up in six big camps along the coastline between Holland and Brest. The only thing the First Consul lacked for success was marine power. In the midst of military preparations, Napoleon took the next step of his astonishing political career by assuming the title of Emperor. On the 18th of May, 1804, the second consul and president of the Senate, Cambaceres, arrived in San Clu, accompanied by all the senators and a large army corps. He pronounced a fitting address and for the first time gave Bonaparte the title of Majesty. Bonaparte accepted it as coolly as if he had the right to use it all his life. France expected Bonaparte to safeguard the rights and liberties of the people. 
Napoleon largely fulfilled that hope by adopting the famous Civil Code, which guaranteed personal and proprietary freedom, equal legal rights for citizens, and religious tolerance. The fact that the First Consul of France turned into her Emperor did not in the least appease the members of the Third Coalition. In the opinion of aristocratic Europe, Napoleon remained a soldier of the Revolution. European rulers could do without the restoration of the Bourbons, could be reconciled with constitutional restriction of royal authority, or even agree to a republic. But to suffer an upstart next door meant letting their subjects take lessons of an ambition which threatened feudal monarchies. Hearing of the Austrian invasion of Bavaria, Napoleon swiftly reacted to the change in strategic situation. By his decree of the 23rd of August 1805, the Army of Ocean Shores was renamed the Grande Armée. The Imperial Command was read to the lined-up ranks. Brave soldiers, you are not going to England. English gold has tempted the Emperor of Austria, and he has declared war on France. His army has violated the frontiers which had to be observed. Bavaria is taken. Soldiers, new laurels await you on the Rhine. Let us go and conquer the enemy whom we have already beaten. Seven corps of the Grande Armée moved towards Bavaria. By the 6th of October 1805, 170,000 Frenchmen completed a covert encircling maneuver past the right flank of the Austrian army. General Mack had no idea of the danger he was in. On the 17th of October, after several successful battles, Napoleon's army surrounded 25,000 Austrians under Mack himself in the fortress of Ulm. On the 20th of October, the remains of that German army capitulated. Russian forces, commanded by Kutuzov, were marching to join the Austrians, but found themselves alone and outnumbered by Napoleon's troops. The French Emperor started to pursue the Russian army and occupied a considerable part of Habsburg territory. Near the small Moravian town of Austerlitz, Kutuzov received some reinforcements. Both sides were getting ready for a decisive clash. Alexander was caught in the net woven by his enemy. He followed the advice of his young counselors to attack. The plan of the offensive was worked out by the Austrian general Franz von Weyrotha. In accordance with it, three columns of Russian troops were to round the right flank of the Grande Armée, while the fourth column, deployed on Prazen Heights, had to attack the French center. Kutuzov was full of ill premonitions. At dawn on the 2nd of December 1805, he lingered on Prazen Heights, which he considered a crucial position in the battle. The Emperor finally appeared there and asked his commander-in-chief, Mikhail Ilarionovich, why don't you advance? I'm waiting for all troops of the column to assemble. Kutuzov cautiously replied. Alexander smiled benignly and, anticipating a triumph, meant to console the old general. But we're not in Tsaritsyn Meadow, 
where a parade is never started until all the regiments arrive? Suddenly, Kutuzov gave vent to his irritation, which had mounted during his night vigil. Sire, I am not moving precisely because this is not Tsaritsyn Meadow. Nevertheless, the Emperor's will was law, and Kutuzov gave the necessary orders. At the very moment when Russians and Austrians were about to leave Prazen Heights, Napoleon prepared to attack that point with Marshal Sewell's corps and his reserves. The thrust of Sewell's divisions instantly broke the center of the Allies. Many regiments took to flight. Alexander tried to stop them in vain. The retreating troops were rescued from utter destruction by Grand Duke Konstantin Pavlovich, who commanded the reserve guards. Heeding the cannonade come closer, he did not wait for orders and moved forward. To repulse this unit, Napoleon had to employ his horse guards under Marshal Bessier, a part of Soule's corps, and Udino's grenadiers. Russian horse and cavalier guards fell by squadrons, but allowed thousands of fugitives to save their lives. Having seen the rout and lost his entire suite apart from one hussar of the guard, Alexander wept bitterly. For many years to come, the defeat of Austerlitz made the Tsar himself and his ministers doubt his military skill. The price of self-assurance and vanity was the loss of 27,000 men and the end of the coalition. Alexander, however, possessed an amazing ability to get out of any seemingly hopeless situation. The disaster of Austerlitz was craftily represented by the Tsar as an unfortunate accident. To satisfy public opinion, scapegoats were found in the Commander-in-Chief Kutuzov, Generals Langeron and Pripyshevsky, and Emperor Franz of Austria. Alexander blamed Kutuzov that, for all his great military experience, he failed to stop the young Tsar from following Weyrotter's absurd plan. The generals were accused of mistaken directions on the field of battle, while the Austrians were almost suspected of treason. For all that, the Russian Emperor spurned the idea of a peace with Napoleon. Actively backed by British diplomacy, Alexander lost no time in putting the Fourth Coalition together. King Frederick William III of Prussia was induced to take part in it. This cautious and reticent ruler, somewhat sullen in appearance, saw the drawbacks of his army better than anyone else in Prussia, but Queen Louise and his self-confident generals insisted on war. Prussian officers went to the French embassy in Berlin and defiantly sharpened their swords on the steps of the building. On the 1st of October, 1806, the Prussian government presented Napoleon with an ultimatum to withdraw all French troops from German territory. King Frederick William's army, based in Thuringia, got ready for offensive action. Its commander-in-chief, Duke Ferdinand of Brunswick, hoped to defeat the French even before the Russians arrived. The maneuver of the Grande Armée caught the Prussians in the rear and cut them off from Berlin. On the foggy morning of 14th of October, Napoleon completely destroyed a part of the Royal Army 
under Prince Hohenlo at the Battle of Jena. On the very same day, near the town of Auerstedt, Marshal Davou, with only three infantry divisions, crushed the main Prussian forces. The enemy fled in panic, while the Duke of Brunswick was killed. Strong German fortresses surrendered one by one. On the 27th of October, Napoleon entered Berlin in triumph. Frederick William, with the miserable remnants of his army, retreated to Poland to link up with the Russians, who now had to fight virtually on their own. On the 27th of January, 1807, after a protracted campaign and some heavy fighting, the two armies met near the small town of Prishish Ilau. Their numbers were almost equal, 70,000 men on each side. The Russian commander-in-chief, Cavalry General Bennigsen, decided in favor of a pitched battle. The Russian army arrayed in columns and approached the French to half the distance of a cannon shot. Davout's corps took the Russians in the rear. At the same time, Marshal Augereau, with his columns, struck against the opposing center, engaging most of the Russian regiments and making it difficult for them to thwart Davout. But before long, Augereau's corps came under fire of the Russian artillery and scattered, and its remains were beaten by Bennigsen's infantry in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uncertain of the outcome, Napoleon threw in his cavalry reserve under Murat. Two lines of Russian infantry were overcome, but the third one entrenched on the edge of a forest and put up staunch resistance. Both the Russians and the French were exhausted by the long and bloody battle. For the first time in his military career, Napoleon failed to attain a decisive victory. The delighted Alexander amply rewarded Bennigsen and prepared to join his army on campaign. He thought that Austerlitz would soon be avenged. On the 4th of April, Alexander and Frederick William inspected the Russian guards, but already on the 14th of June, 1807, Napoleon trapped Bennigsen near Friedland. The Russian army was assaulted while crossing the River Ali and suffered a serious reverse. The Tsar now had to delay his revenge and to think fast about peace instead. On the 22nd of June, 1807, Alexander proposed to conclude a truce with Napoleon. The victorious commander readily agreed to the offer, adding that he desired to sign a friendly alliance with Russia. The night of the 24th of June, 1807, French pontonniers constructed a raft with two pavilions on the Niemen River. On the morning of the 25th, Alexander and Napoleon met there. For the first time, the two powerful rulers stood face to face. It was vital for Alexander to start with a well-calculated phrase, and he found one. Sire, said the Russian Tsar to Napoleon, I abhor the English as much as you do. In that case, everything will be settled and our peace sealed, answered the Emperor of France. On 
On the 7th of July, 1807, a treaty of peace and union between Russia and France was signed at Tilsit, along with a Franco-Prussian peace. Napoleon considered his greatest diplomatic victory Russia's joining the Continental Blockade proclaimed by him. The purpose of the blockade was to close the European market completely to British goods and to prevent Britain from importing raw materials she needed from Europe and Russia. According to the French Emperor's scheme, strict enforcement of the blockade would lead to the economic collapse of the British Empire. When already exiled to St. Helena, Bonaparte revealed the ultimate aim of his policy of conquest. The whole of Europe would form one nation, one family. There would be the same laws, same money, and same measures everywhere. I would have demanded that not just the seas, but all the rivers be open to common trade and the armies of all powers be limited to the guard of their rulers. I would have created my son joint emperor. My reign as dictator would then be over, to begin a constitutional one. Paris would become the capital of the world. Napoleon proceeded towards his goal with single-minded consistency. In 1804, Along with the title of French Emperor, he received the Iron Crown of the Kings of Lombardy, while his stepson, Eugène Beauharnais, became Viceroy of Italy. In 1806, Louis Bonaparte got the title of the King of Holland. In 1807, Jerome obtained the Crown of Westphalia. In 1808, Joseph ascended the Spanish throne, while Joachim Mura, husband of Caroline Bonaparte, received the throne of Naples. Napoleon's sisters, Elisa and Pauline, became known respectively as the Duchess of Tuscany and the Princess of Guastalia. In Spain, though, something occurred which Napoleon was not accustomed to after an unbroken string of brilliant victories. Circumstances and the Spanish people refused to obey his will. When King Charles IV of Spain, his wife Maria Luisa, their son Ferdinand, and Prime Minister Manuel de Godoy quarreled with each other, they found no better way out but to submit their family feud to Napoleon's judgment. Napoleon summoned them to Bayonne for a meeting, intimidated them, and succeeded in getting the royal family's abdication in favor of Joseph Bonaparte. But the emperor's insolence resulted in a mighty national rising against French occupation of Spain. In August 1808, the British army, under General Arthur Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, set out from Portugal to assist the Spaniards. In November 1808, Napoleon invaded Spain with an army of 180,000 seasoned veterans. Joseph was restored to the throne but Napoleon was powerless to suppress the guerrilla war backed by the British. Spain became a snare where the Emperor's best regiments aimlessly met their end. <laughs> ¶¶ 
In the spring of 1809, Napoleon received the troublesome news that 300,000 Austrians, headed by the able strategist, the Archduke Charles, had entered Bavaria. In Napoleon's absence, Berthier, who commanded the forces of France and the Rhine Alliance in Germany, was losing control. Overriding his horses to death, Napoleon rushed to Bavaria. Within five days, between the 19th and 23rd of April, he defeated Austrian contingents at Abensburg, Landshut, Echmull, and Regensburg, clearing his way to Vienna. But with the fall of the Austrian capital on the 13th of May, hostilities did not cease. When Napoleon pursued the retreating Austrians and began to cross the Danube on the 21st of May, Archduke Charles suddenly assailed him near Aspern and carried the day. It was only with the greatest efforts and huge losses that Napoleon managed to repulse Charles after the two-day Battle of Bagram on the 5th and 6th of July. Nearly a half of Bonaparte's army now consisted of troops recruited in the countries which he had conquered. The Grande Armée gradually began to lose its outstanding fighting qualities, although few people noticed this as yet, while Napoleon still firmly believed in his lucky star. However, he had his own grave suspicions. The Russian army was supposed to cooperate with his forces, but it contrived to finish the campaign without giving the Austrians a single battle. The Emperor of France reaped the fruit of his latest triumph. For a long while, he was not content with his marriage to Josephine. Napoleon strove hard to create an image of himself as a legitimate monarch and searched for a bride who could unite his dynasty with the ancient ruling houses of Europe. The first step had to be a divorce with Josephine, which brought much anguish to both of them. For almost fifteen years she adorned my life, complained Napoleon to his friends. But political necessity proved stronger than youthful memories, and their divorce was concluded on the 15th of December, 1809. At first, Napoleon sought the hand of Grand Duchess Catherine Pavlovna of Russia, but Alexander put him off with vague compliments and hastily arranged his sister's engagement to Prince George of Oldenburg. The offended suitor instantly looked in the other direction and offered his heart and hand to Maria Louise, daughter of Emperor Franz of Austria. Franz, who had just been subdued by the army of the Corsican monster, was in no position to decline the honour. On the 11th of March, 1810, a solemn wedding took place in Vienna, although Napoleon himself was too busy to attend it, and ordered Marshal Berthier to act as his proxy. By this time, almost all the members of Bonaparte's clan received their own crowns. After the signing of the Tilsit Treaties, Alexander I found himself in a situation almost as menacing as on the eve of Paul's murder. If the Tsar decided to resume the struggle with Napoleon, another military failure could cost him his throne. But Tilsit aroused as much indignation among the Russian nobility 
as Friedland had. The union with the soldier of the revolution seemed preposterous, both to conservative monarchists and to admirers of the British constitution. Moreover, the breach of economic links with Britain painfully affected the income of landowners. Count Tolstoy once told the Emperor, Watch out, sire. You may end up like your father. Russian society was indeed stirred by rumors of another imminent conspiracy. It was said that the whole male line of the ruling house could be removed, and since Alexander's mother, Maria Fyodorovna, and his wife, Empress Elizabeth, lacked the necessary qualities, Grand Duchess Catherine should be put on the throne. To preserve his life and his crown, Alexander contrived and gradually accomplished a sophisticated political scheme. For a start, the Tsar discarded his young friends, Stroganov, Tsartarysky, Novosiltsev, and Kochube, whom public opinion largely blamed for the setbacks of 1805 to 1807. The post of Chancellor went to Count Nikolai Rumyantsev, a confirmed adherent of the independent development of Russian industry and commerce, who hoped to use the Tilsit treaties to that end. The newly appointed Secretary of State, Mikhail Speransky, submitted to the Emperor a profound program of reforms in the country's political structure. Prince Alexei Kurakin, one of the few men who believed that the Russo-French alliance was tactically indispensable, set out for Paris as Russian ambassador. Meanwhile, Alexander, well aware that the party of discontent was encouraged by Maria Fyodorovna, decided to explain his views to the opposition through his mother. Alexander wrote her a long letter claiming that he only needed an alliance with Napoleon in order to gain an opportunity to breathe freely for a while and to augment our means and forces during that time which is so precious. <laughs> 